Okay, we are live. All right, well, hello everyone and welcome to a new season of uh, Wichita Audubon programs. I had to turn off the audio there a second. Okay, uh, my name is Kevin Grunewig and I'm the new Wichita Audubon Vice President in charge of programs. So I'll be bringing you the programs for uh, this season. We were hoping to uh, get back at the Great Plains Nature Center, but looks like COVID's not gonna let that happen. So uh, here we are again, uh, having our meetings virtually, but we're gonna, we're gonna do the meetings this year. So October and November virtually, uh, and then make a decision on whether we might be able to have a chance to get back together at the Great Plains Nature Center. And so if we do, uh, hopefully we can get back together in the auditorium there at, uh, in Jan for our January meeting. So of course we'll uh, make announcements on that. So stay tuned uh, on that. So, uh, okay, uh, I do wanna, uh, give a shout out to uh, uh, Rachel, our our um, our past vice president, who put on the programs in the past, and uh, she has set up a slate of programs for this year. And so I want to give her a big thanks for uh, for getting that all set up. We've got a lot of good programs for you. Um, okay, so a little bit of business to take care of first. Uh, a few upcoming events. Uh, this Saturday at Chaplin Nature Center, we have our Monarch Tagging Nature Day. So that goes from 10 o'clock to 3 o'clock. And uh, that's always a fun event, uh, tagging the monarchs. I've seen quite a few out there. Don't know what this front has done, but um, sh uh, should, be, should be good. Uh, there's guided hikes to the river, also uh, a lunch available for purchase uh, if you so desire. So... Uh, so that's happening Saturday. Also at Chaplin, there's a uh, moon walk run. It's a 2K walk run um, in uh, with a full moon. Uh, so this will be in the evening, Saturday, October 16, 7.30 to 10.30 p.m. So that's, uh, that's kind of an interesting event also. And then uh, I'll mention, we do have an upcoming field trip uh, we'll be having a meeting between then, but I just wanted to get it out there so you can get it on your calendar if you don't already. Uh, Saturday, October 23rd to Slate Creek Wetland, and that's going to be led by Gene Young. And so we're meeting at the Baptist Church uh, there on Oxford Road at 8 o'clock, and that goes till noon. So that's just a, a morning thing, and we'll be looking for all kinds of fall sparrows and hopefully uh, LeConte's and maybe a Nelson sparrow. So. Anyway, uh, one other piece of business uh, to take care of. You uh, may see uh, Tom Ewert's uh, smiling face uh, on the screen as well. Uh, and uh, tonight, we are honoring Tom with the Meritorious Service Award. So let me, I'm just going to quickly show... Uh, uh, the certificate for that um, award, just so that you can see what it says, uh, signed by Dan Householder, our president. Uh, Dan asked me to go ahead and present tonight since I'm uh, hosting the, uh, the uh, online meeting. So um, anyway, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the history that Tom has with the society. So uh, he was president from 2017 to 2019. Uh, he's been on the board uh, for quite a while, uh, from 2012, uh, pretty much through 2021, with a little break in between while he was president. Uh, he's been our uh, Audubon of Kansas representative uh, since 2014. He's currently the treasurer, and so we are actually looking for another representative to AOK, so... I'll just kind of put a plug out there in case some, someone might be interested in that. 
He's also been our field trip chair uh, for, uh, since uh, 2019 and also led one of our extended field trips in uh, Southeast Oklahoma. That was in 2016. He's been our membership chair. And so that was 2013 to 2017. Uh, and then also has been involved in uh, fundraising and or has organized a birdathon team that he's been running since 2015, the Roadrunners. And so uh, that's been a good uh, fundraising uh, event uh, for us. And then also, uh, last but not least, he's been an activist and representative on the feral cat issue. And he's been uh, very instrumental in keeping the uh, city ordinance from changing uh, that would allow feral cats to be roaming the streets. And so... Um, uh, uh, he, he's, he's really been, uh, he, we've, he's had a lot of success with that. And so, uh, we're all very grateful. So anyway, that's, uh, those are some of Tom's accomplishments. Uh, Tom, do you have anything you'd like to say? Nothing much. I just thank you for the award. Uh, I didn't expect it and I'll just keep doing what I've been doing, which is having fun and being involved. All right. Well, we're certainly glad to have you, uh, involved and uh and uh, thank you for all the great things that you've done for our society and uh so uh good good work and and all of you out there uh if you see tom give him a pat on the back and thank him for all of his hard work so thank you all right thanks tom all right well i think that takes care of all of the business that i have um, at this point, I'm going to introduce our speaker for this evening. Uh, he's Todd Volkman. Um, and so, uh, let's see, Todd is the, um, is the uh, exhibit caretaker, the current exhibit caretaker at the Kansas Wildlife Exhibit in Riverside Park. And he's also a former naturalist at the Great Plains Nature Center. So many of you may have seen him there. So um, with no further ado, I will turn it over to Todd. Thank you, Kevin. Hello, everybody. I'm gonna try to start my presentation. I've had some technical difficulties already, so bear with me a, a little bit. Oh, and I'll, I'll, while that's um, while that's coming up, I'll just mention um, for anyone who has a comment or questions they'd like to ask Todd, uh, go ahead and throw those in the comment section on the YouTube channel, and we'll uh, we'll have Todd answer those for you. Thank you. Looks like it's uh, ready to go now. So. Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm pretty happy to be here. I am inside the Kansas Wildlife Exhibit in a, a new feature that I'm going to talk about here pretty soon. And I am always happy to share with anybody listening about the history and happenings of the wildlife exhibit or the Riverside zoos in the past. Uh, this presentation is going to touch upon a pretty fascinating world and it's sometimes entertaining of the, the zoos and history that were in Central Riverside Park. Um, also, I kind of want to touch upon what's happening now and give a little hint about what the, the future might hold. Now, there's a lot I wanted to talk about and share, but um, luckily I'm not that great at visual presentations. And so you're, you're going to be forced to come in and visit me at some point, and I can, I can share those in person. Um, we also give behind the scenes tours of the place. Uh, there's a lot of history here, and it does help to be kind of physically in the building so you can truly absorb that. Um, the building I'm in has been here for 100 years. In fact, just a month ago was the 100 year anniversary of it uh, being built. And I'm often happy to take a break and discuss the exhibit or, or anything really if, if you do come and visit. Now, before I step back about 120 years to when the, the start of the, the zoos happened, um, there's a few tasks I would like to, to get out of the way. Uh, one is just 
little, a little more introduction about myself. Um, I am the exhibit caretaker at the wildlife exhibit and former naturalist at the nature center. I am sometimes referred to as turtle Todd and I'm okay with that uh, for fun. In fact, I just mentioned this with, with Kevin. I do like to go out and look under rocks. Um, I do pair well with bird people. Um, they keep an eye out above and I like to look for things down below, like really anything you would find underneath a rock. Um, in particular, herpetology. And I'll also touch upon that here in a little bit. Now, I love my job and I love being at the wildlife exhibit. Um, my time at the Nature Center, I, everything I learned there, I kind of want, I wanted to bring here as well. Uh, the aspects there and the, the engagements that take place, I, I wanted to bring to the wildlife exhibit. Uh, the history of this place, um, the people that are just endeared to it, uh, whether they're regulars in the neighborhood or even uh, people that are visiting from out of town that just want somewhere to go when, when they're in downtown Wichita, uh, meeting with these people and the surprise engagements that take place. Um, when people take their kids to go to a splash park or the, the playground, they don't always expect to you know, have a conversation about a bobcat or watch it eat a rat or um, something like that, that that takes place or a beaver walking around the exhibit. Um, those are pretty special moments. And that's one of the reasons that this place really has such lasting memories, I think, for, for a lot of people. And what's probably the best deal about it is that it's free. Uh, it's, it's always been free. It's been free for 120 years. And I like to say that's always a good sales pitch. And it's a pretty important part, I think, of uh, Wichita Park and Recreation. Um, my goal this evening is to not only share about the history of the Riverside Zoos, but also remind people kind of what a treasure of the Kansas Wildlife Exhibit is. Now, if you can visit, um, I'm going to talk about some of the current residents here in a little bit. But I did want to bring up, especially that, that sign that's hanging right below Rufus the Bobcat, feeding time is at noon every day. Uh, this is your best chance to see as much as possible. Turtles and birds are visible throughout the day, and but mammals tend to be pretty food motivated and a lot of them kind of keep to their schedule. Uh, that sign is pretty accurate. Um, in the afternoon, that's what Rufus does somewhere. He's often out of sight, but Occasionally, he, he will nap in the open. Um, it also mentions our social media. And speaking of social media, we're on social media. In fact, I would not be offended if you take a few moments to follow Kansas Wildlife Exhibit right now. Hopefully, you already do. Um, I only post every couple of days. And who doesn't like a little nature in your news? And I'm considering going all nature myself with the news here. And lastly, I um, want to thank Jim Mason. Um, the historical portion of this presentation relies heavily on his really extensive research and work that he's done. Uh, I hope to expand on this presentation and in the future continue to learn more about uh, the park myself. For those of you who are not familiar with the Kansas Wildlife Exhibit or where the zoos were located, I'm going to begin with an introduction to Central Riverside Park itself. Now, if you see this sign, you're close to the wildlife exhibit. In fact, it is directly behind it. Uh, the park has undergone many changes throughout its history. Now, the first example of a technical difficult, oh, there it is. So this is a, an old map, and that is Central Riverside Park. Now, the Murdoch Ridge is to the right, and that oval is a racetrack. Um, that was really the only feature in the park besides um, just, just trees. Now, currently, a lot has changed, including the ability to take pictures from space. Um, this is an aerial view, and uh, the Kansas Wildlife Exhibit is in the roundabout in the lower center. Uh, there's still an oval kind of paying homage to the, the racetrack days. And there are other features in the park that are popular. I mentioned the splash pad, the playground, and also an astrological calendar, which kind of makes the changing seasons fun, and depending on who shows up. Now, there are a few scenes from the early years of uh, Central Riverside Park that don't necessarily have to do with uh, the zoos, but I do want to share a few of those just so you have an idea of 
what has been here. Um, the entrances used to be rather grand. Uh, this one was also from that um, Oak Street or Murdoch Bridge um, that is leading into the park. Um, and nearby was also the, the original boathouse, uh, which underwent quite a few changes over the decades. Um, it, was, it was quite the scene. It is hard to imagine. There was also a high, a high dive just going into the river. Um, I have walked across the river almost uh, nearby, but uh, it used to be dredged and boating was a pretty common activity. Um, Sunday fun days are still happening. Uh, that was a very popular day to visit the park. Uh, pictured is uh, the first grandstand that was built in 1899 and gatherings were really just kind of a, a common thing, especially on the weekends. Now this scene jumps ahead a few decades, but it is still an older photo and it shows um, not only the a pond, but also the infamous alligator pit, which is in the lower right. Uh, also notice that there isn't much in the way of keeping people out of it. Uh, that is a pretty low stone wall. Looks like there might be a, also a low railing. Um, over the years, it did become a little more, uh, a little more formidable. And uh, you'll see some pictures of that later on. Uh, there were many gardens, uh, many pond features, and just many structures throughout the decades in the park as it, as it changed. Now, an entrance from the north, uh, close to Wiley Street. Um, this shows how a lot of people would arrive at the park um, in the early 1900s. Uh, you have to would involve attaching your buggy to your horse. Now, I mentioned that oval earlier. Um, it's referred to as a race track, but really it was more of a, a leisurely track for people on their horses or in their buggies. Um, I guess a few races did take place, but they were not a common feature of the park. Now, the first animal that was ever on display in the park was a white-tailed deer. Um, this may not sound very exotic. In fact, it's really pretty commonplace now. Uh, the picture is from 1902, and over the course of a few months, they did have white-tailed deer, elk, and pronghorn. And at the time, it, these are animals that were not very common. Um, it wasn't just bison that were removed from the, the prairies in the 1800s, really it was every large mammal. Um, in addition to bison, that did include white-tailed deer, pronghorn, elk, uh, bears, wolves. Um, in about a 20-year period, they were all pretty much removed from at least the state of Kansas. a rather impressive elk photo. Um, notice how close people can just kind of walk up to these animals, um, especially dealing with bison. And this photo may not load. So we're still on the elk. Uh, but the houses that are shown in the background, those are still here. So this is kind of on the north end of the park. In fact, I was at that house today. They're cutting down a massive cottonwood and a bit of coincidence that uh, they wanted to donate to the, the wildlife exhibit. Um, it's, it's hollowed out. I don't think it's 110 years old, but it is a very old, large tree. And um, 100 years ago, they could probably smell the animals that were just probably less than 100 feet away that were kept in the park. Um, that was an issue with uh, the animals here. In fact, um, by 1918, they had been moved out of the, the riverside area. So there were no large, no more large ungulates. And that was my fault. I reversed those photos. So bison showed up in 1910. Now, that was a very big deal. Um, for the most part, the, the bison population that was around Yellowstone 
uh, was kind of slowly being dispersed around. There weren't that many animals uh, to go places and Wichita did end up with one in 1910. Uh, his name was Beacon. And Beacon did not last very long. Uh, <laughs> a couple of years later, right before Christmas, uh, due to his temperament, it was decided that Beacon probably should not be in the park. Uh, he was butchered slightly before Christmas as kind of served as Christmas part of a Christmas dinner. And when I shared this, it wasn't received very well. Uh, but at the time, it was really quite, quite the ceremony. Uh, the person who did shoot Beacon was part of the Spanish-American War. Uh, there were quite a few onlookers. And he was not the last bison. They did, they did try it again over the next couple of years. Now, since this is the Audubon Society, I'm going to spend a little bit of time of talking about the, the history of the birds there. Now, ostriches, they were not in the park for very long. Um, again, they, they were in a pen. Uh, they had pretty close engagement with any of the visitors. And there was kind of some speculation that the care might have not been the best in addition to people probably feeding them things that they shouldn't. Uh, that's still a concern with <laughs> with the exhibit today and zoos in general, but especially when you're that close to, to wildlife, um, I imagine they got really all kinds of snacks. Now this particular um, waterfowl pond was built in 1910 and it was still in the park up until 2002. It was considered a waterfowl pond. Uh, there's some geese and ducks pictured and also a pelican. Now, pelicans are have been a part of the, the Wichita zoos, and I'm going to share a pretty fun story about one because it is the introduction to probably my favorite book. Now, there was also a birdhouse. Now, this birdhouse was built in 22. It lasted about probably uh, 20 years, and it was kind of difficult to maintain. Um, it was a wood structure, uh, heating it, trying to keep the birds alive in the winter time. And in addition to condensation, just kind of rotted the building away and it just didn't last, didn't last very long. However, that pelican picture and this birdhouse were a wonderful part of my favorite book, which is I Will Trade You an Elk. Now, I could probably have a presentation about this book by itself, but in particular, I wanted to share about the pelican. Uh, the book opens up with a new zookeeper going on an adventure um, trying to pick up a pelican. Now, if I just randomly did that, I, would, I wouldn't necessarily know what to take myself, um, but he took basically just a little gunny sack to put the pelican in, um, went to a farmhouse where there was an injured pelican, kind of shenanigans. his ensued and he managed to get the pelican into this sack. If you think about a car from the 1930s with a large pelican in the back seat with its head sticking out just so it couldn't beat, it, beat everybody up with its wings. That's how this book starts off and it's a pretty good indication of how kind of things transpired throughout it. Uh, there were a lot of shenanigans, um, a lot of accumulation of animals during that time. Um, during the 30s, during the depression era, um, a lot of people were, were looking for something free to do. And again, that's a very important part of the, the zoo history and the wildlife exhibit right now is that it is a free destination. And in addition to that pelican, um, probably the best or one of the more entertaining stories had to do with um, the trading of a minor bird. So the first really trade, and even though it's called I'll trade you an elk, the first trade was the trade of a minor bird and um, Goodrum didn't really know how to go about that. So he wrote letters to zoos and the only one that, and what he wanted were some finches in return, maybe some parakeets or lovebirds and a cockatiel. And this San Antonio Zoo responded 
they accepted their trade. And in a couple of weeks, he was contacted by the, the rail company that a couple uh, boxes had arrived with live animals and that he needed to come pick them up right away. So he went there with his son, who's the author of this book, uh, Charles, or also called Chuck. And they go to this rail company to pick up a couple of birds and they have in their possession one bird cage, probably just for a few parakeets. And when they get there, there are two rather large crates, like very large shipping crates. And the packing slip stated that there were inside these crates, 200 parakeets, 40 finches, 20 lovebirds. And since they mentioned a cockatiel, one cockatiel. And value wise, uh, they learned how much a minor bird is compared to really popular uh, pet birds. Now, most of these birds did survive. Uh, again, this was, this was in the fall and this really worked out pretty well. So they did keep some of the birds uh, for that bird house and they ended up selling most of the parakeets. So this was shortly before Christmas. Um, There's a, a dime store in town that bought them. And so with $150 that allowed him to make really his first animal purchase. So that's how animals, animals were traded, animals were bought and it was through that, the selling of those parakeets that allowed them to make their first purchase for the lion house. Now, this is the, the previous lion house, but it was a rather ornate building uh, built in 1912. It did only last for about, for about 10 years. Uh, it did succumb to a fire. Um, please notice the stonework because those are, those are gonna come up again. Now, other popular residents throughout the zoo days were quite a series of bears. Uh, this was the first enclosure. Now, um, really pretty much any zoo setting in the early 1900s uh, was rather simple. It was a concrete slab with iron bars. Uh, zoos and exhibits have really come a long ways. Uh, this was the second feature called Bear Mountain. Um, there were dens and places they could hide, um, much more sizable feature, and they're better off in this situation. And on the other side of that bear mountain, there were usually a couple leopards, um, even though the leopards did change, uh, their names were only Spot and Speck. Now, I mentioned that Park Zoo building um, burning down after only a decade. And this structure was built in its place. Now, some people, when they visit uh, the Central Riverside Park, they remember this structure because it was there until the early 70s. Uh, this was the Lion and Monkey House. Now, the stonework that was a part of the old park zoo building became the wall that is around this uh, second Lion and Monkey House. In fact, that wall is still there and it goes around the current Kansas wildlife exhibit. So that um, stone has been recycled quite a few times. In fact, before it was the park zoo, uh, it was, they used to be paver stones for the old trolley system downtown. Now inside this structure, uh, one side was mainly for cats. Uh, pictured is a male lion named King um, they also had cheetahs, leopards, and they usually had more than one lion at a time. Um, on the other side, it was typically primates. Uh, they're all different kinds. They <clears throat> were often um, housed together if they could get along. Now, some of the stories I've heard uh, typically had to do with the smell of this building. Um, imagine it was probably difficult to, to clean on a very regular basis. And the worst part of it probably had to do with um, the behaviors of some of the monkeys and some of the things that they would throw at people. Now, underneath this building, there was a basement, which during the winter housed three alligators. And these are probably the most talked about animals from 
the zoo days. Um, the alligator pit, I imagine, just was a very easy to remember as a kid. Um, three sizable alligators. Apparently, they didn't move, move very much, but they had the same three alligators in Central Riverside Park for over 60 years. I never really thought about the lifespan of alligators that much, but uh, they were here a long time and a lot of people saw them. Uh, generations of people grew up with the same three alligators in the park, uh, much like probably people do with the, the tortoises that are at Cedric County Zoo now. Um, the alligator pit that you saw earlier after a few decades, uh, if you notice, was covered with a, a wire structure uh, not only to probably keep people from falling in, but to keep things from being thrown in. Now, twice a year, um, in the fall, they would move them into the building to be to spend the winter, and in the spring, they would bring them out. Um, in both cases, this was really kind of a, a, cer a ceremony of sorts. Um, area schools, like Riverside School, would be let out just to kind of join in on the occasion. And I just can't believe that there were alligators probably 100 feet from me for that many decades. Um, between the alligators and the lion houses are probably the two most talked about uh, features of the, of the zoo days. But speaking of zoos, um, as endearing as a lot of the memories were in this park for the exotic animals that were here, uh, there was a push kind of to de develop more of a, a modern or big city zoo in the 60s. And after a few years, uh, there was quite a bit of success. Um, the Central County Zoo is this year celebrating its uh, 50th anniversary. And that marked a big transition. So no, there, the animals were, for the most part, dispersed, or at least all the large animals. So the lions and the large cats went to a sanctuary in California. Uh, the three alligators, um, they did stay together and they spent the rest of their years at the Tulsa Zoo. And a lot of the other animals were kind of dispersed among the, um, the area zoos, like uh, in Topeka and Independence and um, the other regional zoos. Um, oddly enough, not one animal from the Riverside Zoo went to the Sedgwick County Zoo. Now, after that time, there was still a zoo in the park, just it, there were some drastic changes. Um, a lot of people do remember this particular structure. They might remember some smaller monkeys and a, a few other animals that were, that were still around. But there was a transition after this point. And a lot of it had to do with um, native animals and also education. Um, So in the 80s, <clears throat> there was a push to create the, the Kansas Wildlife Exhibit. Now pictured, you'll notice that the, the park zoo wall, uh, there's little kind of corners of it on the left and right side. That is still there. Um, the building I'm sitting in right now is the Kansas Wildlife Exhibit Building. And that grassy area in the middle is the former site of the park zoo and also that lion and monkey house. And that is where the current Kansas wildlife exhibit structure exists. And construction on that began in uh, 1987. There are the bones of it. Um, so the digging of the ponds. Now, uh, beavers have kind of been a mainstay of the Kansas Wildlife Exhibit. Um, it's it's been <clears throat> it's been restructured a few times since, uh, but that den is still there, and there is an underwater entrance for uh, the beaver to enter and exit as as it pleases. Um, the first one was Webster the beaver. Now, Webster was also a part of the grand opening being possibly fed by uh, Bob Gress. 
Now, I wasn't at the grand opening, but I do remember seeing um, Webster when I was younger. In fact, I can rather vividly remember him eating grapes into a microphone. Uh, it's just one of the odd sounds. In fact, I should probably uh, replicate that at some point with our current beaver. Um, in addition to, to Webster, there were other native animals here. Um, it wasn't the same time, but I also saw uh, Bob with a golden eagle at an assembly at my school. And those are some pretty powerful moments. Um, again, these are native animals. Uh, these are free experiences. People could come to the park to see those animals or there'd be outreach programs of people going to a park, or an event or to a school to, to share them. And that is still done today. Um, the success of really the, these programs also kind of directly led to the creation of the Great Plains Nature Center and the collaboration and all the amazing work that they do. And today, or at least after that, the Kansas Wildlife Exhibit, at least for the past few decades, has consistently had native animals um, since really opening in on Halloween of 88. Um, it's housed um, quite a variety. Um, Bobcat has usually been here. I think there's been a beaver here almost that entire time and quite a collection of birds. There's the entrance from the park. Now, transitioning to today, um, there have been a few updates. That includes um, me being here for almost the last two years. Uh, I mentioned earlier about um, implementing like the education and engagement aspect. And despite the circumstances, that has still been a possibility this past year. Now, uh, pictured there with a couple of snapping turtles, an alligator snapping turtle and a common snapping turtle, uh, that is part of the, the feeding time program that I mentioned at the, at the beginning. So in addition to feeding the animals that are inside the exhibit, since a lot of people do come during that, um, during that noon hour, uh, depending on the crowd, we'll often bring something out in the barrier area as well. Now, uh, despite everything closing down, even last year, uh, I think the wildlife exhibit even became busier. Um, people were looking for something to do. Um, the circumstances were kind of bittersweet, but a lot of people did visit uh, the Kansas Wildlife Exhibit during that time. Um, this past year, I have not done very many field trips. In fact, I've only I've done less than five, uh, but I have been to, to Friends University a couple times. Now, that is one of our really good partners. In fact, uh, some of the students do help me out at the Wildlife Exhibit, and they also help out at uh, the Sedgwick County Zoo and uh, nature center as well, but I, I greatly appreciate their help. And part of that partnership includes helping out, helping each other out with social media. Um, I'm not the best at social media. Um, one of their students was instrumental in starting our Instagram account. And I now use that to share on Facebook. And I do try. I'm not nearly as good as she was, but I, I do try. Now, I do want to share some of the, the current inhabitants or animal ambassadors. Now, I say I don't have favorites, but I do have a favorite, and that is Chuck. Um, Chuck is the turkey vulture. Uh, he's been here for, I think, almost 27 years now. Um, it's very mischievous. He is one of the few animals here that does come inside when it is cold. Um, we do have some fun when he's inside. He doesn't always spend the entire time in his enclosure. Sometimes he likes to hang out on top. Um, pictured, that is Chuck's baby picture. He's a little embarrassed by it, but uh, that was one of our more popular shares from last year. Uh, nice. One of the nice things about Chuck is that he has been here for a long time. People kind of expect to see him when they do visit. Um, he's really pretty engaging at feeding time. Uh, some of his behaviors um, depending on what, he, what he's eating can be pretty entertaining. He does get enrichment devices, uh, similar things that you would use to give to maybe a cat or a puppy that they would have to manipulate to open. Uh, Chuck is pretty good at doing that with his beak. 
Um, Chuck has been known to attack people. Um, <laughs> he often goes after hair. He'll sleep on the hats and go after shoelaces. Um, he has stolen a pair of sunglasses off my face and flown off with them. Um, although most of the birds at the wildlife exhibit are physically injured, he's one of the few birds here that is fully flighted, so he can get around pretty well. Um, that picture in the top right corner, that's part of his morning routine. I imagine most of you are familiar with uh, some of the behaviors of vultures, but in the morning that is a pose that they like to like to do, uh, called the heraldic pose, uh, raises their body temperature, dries off their wings, uh, possibly kills off pathogens. Um, it is quite a sight whenever I see pictures of dozens of them doing that on a, on a barn or a water tower somewhere. But uh, that is how Chuck greets the morning and how a lot of uh, daily visitors see him when they come by in the morning when they're walking their dogs or just kind of going on their morning stroll. I do have a video of Chuck and this is the first video so I will see if this works. Now, Chuck does get the occasional treat. Um, he's also on cleanup duty. So if the, the bobcat or somebody else does not finish their uh, rabbit, squirrel, rat, or quail, uh, Chuck gets a treat. And occasionally, he does a little dance. In the background, you can hear the Franklin's goal. He provides a soundtrack to this place. And Chuck did eat a good portion of that rabbit. And the red-tailed hawks, I think, helped finish it. Now, according to social media and verbally from people that visit, the favorite animal here is Rufus. Now, Rufus is about a two and a half year old bobcat. Um, he's considered imprinted. Um, he definitely is now. Came to us from Milford Nature Center. Um, somehow mixed in with uh, domestic cats in a farm situation. Not really sure how long he was there, but Rufus is now here again. Um, a lot of the animals here are physically injured, especially the birds, but some of them are considered imprinted. Um, Rufus does love squirrels. In fact, they keep him quite occupied in the park, um, in addition to the birds and the, his beaver neighbor. In a lot of ways, he does resemble or act like a domestic cat. Uh, one of the things I've been uh, pretty consistent with since I've been here is uh, trying not to anthropomorphize things. Um, if you think about the accidental bites and scratches that you can get from a, a pet cat, it would be a lot worse from Rufus. Uh, we do have a kind of a morning routine that we go with, go through with him. A lot of his enrichment has to do with smells and things that we can do from outside of his enclosure um, because he is, he is still fully armed. Now, part of Rufus's enrichment It's not a real bird. Rufus also had the best Christmas of any animal here. Um, I did make an Amazon wish list last, last holiday season, and uh, Rufus got, I think, everything that he asked for. Um, he does destroy a lot of his enrichment. Um, that, I don't think um, toys like that bird really last very long. Uh, a lot of his enrichment does have to do with smells and things that can just be added. Um, really, anything that smells like another animal gets his nose going pretty well. And feeding time itself is also pretty enriching. We don't just put food in the dish for him. Uh, he does have to work for quite a bit, either uh, kind of going on a search around his enclosure, trying to find it, or trying to get it out of some kind of box or device that, that we give to him. Now, he has caught real birds as well, uh, especially during that cold snap that we had this past February. Uh, the pond water was still changed, and a lot of birds did try to work their way into the exhibit. 
although they're fine probably going in next door to the beaver, I don't think any of them left Rufus's enclosure. Now, here is Choppa. Uh, this is the neighbor of Rufus. Now, Choppa is a legend. Uh, the picture on the left was taken after Choppa spent four full days um, really out on his own in the Ark River. Um, he did escape, or it was said that he escaped. Chances are he probably had some, some help in, in the matters before we had a security system or cameras. Um, either way, the, the story that took place was really kind of sweet. We can say that now because of how it ended. Uh, people were looking for Choppa uh, behind the scenes. Um, Connie, who was the caretaker here for decades, uh, was keeping an eye on him. And at some point during that uh, fourth night, Choppa came back and he was trying to dig his way back into his enclosure. He, he wanted back in. And that really just kind of did show that uh, he wanted to come home and he's, he's really been here. He's, <laughs> well, he has been here every day since. Um, Choppa is also considered imprinted. Uh, he's pretty food motivated. Um, he likes his sweet potatoes. Uh, occasionally we do bring him out in the barrier area and that gives people an opportunity to see him up close uh, to get a glimpse of his teeth and also his massive uh, kind of paddle feet. Um, Chop is almost nine years old. He's lifespans, a lifespan for a beaver in captivity varies a great deal, but he is starting to show some signs of old age. Um, but hopefully he'll be around for a few more years. Um, Choppa is probably the most work and least seen animal at the wildlife exhibit. Uh, his pond has changed every day. Um, some features of his exhibit are we do change his a wood wall that we kind of wrap around his enclosure uh, that keeps him from chewing on the wire. It also uh, provides him enrichment at night because he does have to he does have to chew on something. I mentioned Choppa does spend some time in the barrier area. He also loves dandelions. Thankful for that. Choppa also helps load his own branches. He does not do that every day, but I wish he did. Um, situations like that, uh, Choppa doesn't come out every day at lunch, but when he does, it's usually pretty crowd pleasing. Um, eventually, I hope to do some engagements in the evening as well. Uh, there's a whole demographic of people that um, haven't spent much time with. Um, also, Choppa's activity level increases a lot in the, in the evening around sunset. And that's, that's a goal for the future. Another popular animal at feeding time is Pokey the possum. Now, she has adapted to that noon feeding time to the point where she wakes up shortly before it every day. Um, she's often um, out waiting, wanting, wanting her treats. Now, people have mixed feelings about possums. I would say she's probably an example of one of the animals that uh, we'd like to kind of uh, tackle some misconceptions about. And she's, yeah, she's absolutely changed a lot of minds about possums. Um, one of the probably the most endearing things about Pokey is not just watching her go after her food, but listening to her. One of the most popular videos I shared was just Pokey listening to Pokey eat her lunch uh, for over a minute, and people loved it. Now, really, there's only a couple of the animals that are engaging every day at feeding time. Uh, some of them prefer people not to be the enclosure when they come down to eat. Um, but also during feeding time, that is when the new but still unfinished indoor exhibit is available. Now, uh, part of the part of the building um, 
is used for food prep, there's an office, there's storage, uh, but a former office room has now turned into an indoor exhibit. That is the room I'm sitting in right now, and it is a favorite room of mine. Now, when you open that door that is pictured, you will be greeted by the mural that was behind me, or is behind me right now. Uh, this mural was done by a, graphics, a graphic artist named Lindsay Kernodal. Um, she was an artist at the Sedgwick County Zoo. Um, you can see her around town at um, art markets, and it is an incredible work. It is way more detailed than, than I thought it would be. Um, in addition to probably the three most uh, popular animal ambassadors here, uh, there's a few insect additions. Now, elsewhere around the room, I have a, a curio of uh, curiosities, um, artifacts, do supplement the, the feeding time talks. You can see some skulls and turtle shells there and also Chuck's uh, baby picture. And some of those are changed out. Uh, people that do come even a couple times a week, uh, we try to you know, offer something new for, for them to check out and another reason to, to come by. Uh, you notice there's some artwork on the walls in addition to uh, various enclosures. Um, there are some hatchling turtles that are most of them about a year or two old few snake enclosures in the back. Speaking of snakes, um, people have mixed feelings about snakes. Um, in addition to this uh, gopher snake, we also have a couple hog nose that I like to consider. Those are kind of like the gateway snake. Um, we do have a pretty young one that even if someone does have a fear of snakes, they tend to kind of tolerate that one being um, kind of in the same room. And then we can work our way up to this gopher snake. Um, if you do have an appreciation for reptiles and amphibians, I uh, strongly suggest you also follow the Kansas Herpetological Society. Um, I mentioned that I pair well with uh, bird people and it doesn't hurt to have a, a herp person next to you if, you if you're out birding. Often you can uh, share some stories and you can look for different things uh, while being together. There is a field trip in Ellis County this weekend if you want to check that out. Now, uh, some of the things definitely fall into the, the creepy crawly category. Uh, we do have native, a native scorpion and tarantula that are uh, pretty interesting to talk about. Some people don't want to, but um, uh, the forest quality of a scorpion is also fun to talk about eyesight. Um, salamanders, a lot of people still call them lizards. Uh, people that kind of wander in here and get all different kinds of uh, backgrounds and viewpoints on these animals. And I don't know, the goal here is really just to kind of make um, the environment around them a little more endearing and also knowledgeable of the impact that you can have, especially on um, aquatic life, such as uh, fish, salamanders, and everything else that's in the water. Uh, eventually, I do want to add another aquatic feature in here. Um, I have a fish tank, I have a turtle tank. I would like another tank that has of everything else that you don't really think about, uh, the larva, the crayfish, the, the mussels, and, and things like that. And a feature that I'm really excited about, but is also taking a while to, to finish, and it's going to be amazing. Um, it's important to me because it is about the past, and I mean, the, the future is going to in include a lot about the past. Uh, people are endeared to that. Uh, a lot of the pictures that you saw earlier might be a part of the, uh, the panels that are going to go up. And really, it's just going to kind of be a history closet. Now, <clears throat> so some of the visuals um, will look familiar. Um, that deer mount is going to kind of pay homage to the first animal that was here and also get to uh, have, have conversations about uh, conservation and like the success, the success stories of bringing back white-tailed deer. And in addition to just uh, remembering the zoo days um, to have talks like that when, when appropriate. Um, I've kind of thrown it together, but there is kind of a makeshift alligator pit in this closet. And when it's finished, it's going to be great. Um, <laughs> again, I mentioned that anyone that saw that alligator pit seems to remember it. And kids that visit right now, um, it's apparent why alligators are so memorable because they love those alligator heads. I can see why they've why the alligator pit had such an impact. Now, 
Uh, some of the, uh, oops, I missed the turtles. So dealing with the future, um, it's probably gonna have a lot to do with birds. That should hopefully be good for the Audubon Society. Uh, KBDD is really set up for bird ambassadors and birds can be pretty influ influential. And they also make really excellent program animals uh, going out on field trips or outreach programs. Um, birds are something that a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, they're portrayed if, when dealing with uh, kids. I mean, they're portrayed in cartoons and movies, but rarely do you see a lot of uh, birds up close. Um, these programs are, I think, pretty influential. I mentioned seeing a, a golden eagle when I was younger. Um, I've only probably seen a couple in my lifetime and the only one in Kansas since. And given the size of the Kansas wildlife exhibit and kind of the, the, the way things are shaped, uh, birds make excellent ambassadors here. Um, again, a lot of the ones here are injured. Um, we've only added one since I've been here, but really any future bird that does uh, come to the Kansas wildlife exhibit, ideally I would like it to be able to, to be used on a program, um, to hopefully at least be able to be to work with it so it can be glove trained and um, also be used by the used by the Nature Center. And that is really so we can use them on programs. Um, that is Odin, uh, the Eastern Screech Owl that used to be in the lobby of the Great Plains Nature Center that is now at the, at the wildlife exhibit that we don't bring out on a regular basis, but a couple of times a week. Um, this is again, usually during feeding time or possibly on weekends when there's a lot more people in the park. Uh, we will bring something out in the barrier area. Um, pictured at right is me a couple months ago, uh, back when things were a little better at the Great Plains Nature Center um, during their creature, hmm, not sure if it was creature feature. It was whatever their event was during the, um, during the summer. Um, Chuck even seems to love going on programs. He seems to enjoy car rides and yeah, uh, hopefully things will get better and we can start to do some outreach programs. So in addition to the addition of birds, I'd also like to add some uh, bird features around the exhibit and the park. Um, I am surrounded by water. Um, it would kind of be fun to have a, a Martin house and, and some feeders. And the squirrels probably wouldn't mind too. Um, most of all, I would like to have an eagle ambassador. A couple months ago, we did try to acquire a golden eagle uh, from Wyoming, but another institution did receive it. Um, being kind of picky, um, I mentioned that I would like any bird that shows up to be a possible program bird. Uh, there are a lot of injured eagles looking to be placed. Um, we could probably acquire one in the next couple of weeks if, if we really wanted to, but um, an injured wild bird just for the sake of display. Um, isn't, isn't the first choice. So I'm still holding out hope that um, either a younger bird or just one that has a, a calm demeanor can uh, become available and either a golden eagle or a bald eagle might again become a resident at the wildlife exhibit. Um, there have been some here before. I think they were a pretty powerful feature of, of the exhibit and hopefully will be again at, at some point. Uh, Hope you've enjoyed the, the Riverside Zoo past and updates on the KWE. And I hope you also become a part of its future either by following social media, which again, if you haven't, you can do that at any time. And also by visiting. Um, I love visitors. Again, I'm, the feeding time is every day at noon. I'm pretty much here every morning, but that's usually when a lot of chores are being done. And weekends are a popular time to visit. Uh, there is the social media information again. And I'll give one more shout out to Jim Mason and his thanks for the research and work that he's done and putting that book and his presentation together. And are there any questions? Okay, if, if you have any questions uh, for Todd, uh, please put them in the chat on the, on the YouTube channel. Um, don't 
don't see in anything come in yet. Um, I just want to say that it's uh, it's been great to learn about the history. Uh, a lot of stuff I did not know, and so I learned a lot just from the history. So that's great to see. And then also uh, maybe comment too on uh, you know even though we have the big Sedgwick County Zoo, this really provides an excellent opportunity for folks to engage with the kinds of animals that we have right here and that they use our species that they can go see. And I'm guessing that you probably have a number of folks who are surprised to learn that, you know, these, uh, these uh, different species exist all around them and, and that uh, they can go find them if they, if they wanted to. That's an important, uh, yeah, that's a, that's an important feature. Uh, I mean, bobcats are pretty elusive, but they are out there. Um, birds as well. I mean, a lot of people are familiar with the birds that you see in like suburban and urban settings, but um, some of the ducks we have and other birds are a little less common. Um, and also like the impact people can have. I don't know if I stress that enough. Like a lot of these birds are, I mean, a lot of these animals are here for uh, sad reasons. A lot of them having to do with uh, uh, human impact as well. But yeah, uh, all, all the animals at the wildlife exhibit are, are native to Kansas. And um, even though it's still called the Riverside Zoo, I don't think that's gonna go away. It is an exhibit. Um, I mean, uh, I don't think that really makes much of a difference, but yeah, the Cedric County Zoo is amazing, but I'm also glad that the, there's still a feature in this park and it's still a part of uh, kind of a long string of zoos that have been here. People still have a free place to go look at something. Well, that's great. And I'm sure, as you mentioned, a lot of people uh, uh, who are looking for something to do in these times of COVID uh, find that a, a very attractive option. So uh, I don't have any questions in the chat, but Beth uh, made a comment. I uh, really enjoyed that presentation. So, uh, well, thank you. So, uh, and again, uh, I want to. Okay. I, I guess um, you do programs as well, it looks like. Uh, uh, so I guess people can contact you uh, at the exhibit uh, if they wanted you to um, engage with something like that. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm, not sure if I'm allowed to do outreach. Um, yeah. <laughs> the nice thing about the, the Kansas Wildlife Exhibit is it is outdoors, and it can it can still be engaging. Um, I'm, I kind of mentioned that last year. Um, I mean, people still space out. There's different, I mean, people have different approaches and degrees to that when they're, when they're outdoors. But uh, feeding time, I mean, it might just be a couple people, it might be 20, but there's a lot of space around the exhibit for people to, to space out and still see something and still communicate. Um, I'm usually 20, 30 feet away from somebody when I'm talking about a bobcat or, or the beaver. Um, and probably getting pretty close to the point where I was, like, even if I'm in the barrier area, I can uh, wear a mask, but uh, the indoor exhibit um, may, may not be so lucky. I think uh, time is um, limited for that, but that will give me the opportunity to finish the history closet and add a few other features in here. Um, some of the animals that are in the indoor exhibit can be brought outside in that barrier area. It's just really kind of a nice feature for people to see um, spiders and snakes and, and other things like that. Okay. Well, it's great to see all the new things going on there. I'm, I'm glad to see that uh, the exhibit continues to thrive. So uh, thank you very much, Todd, for the program this evening. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, really appreciate you. Uh, uh, I wish we could have done it in person, but that's okay. Uh, this works too. So uh, thanks again, and uh, glad, you could, uh, glad you could do this for us. My pleasure. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, uh, I guess we'll call it an evening. All right. So thanks again.